Philippians chapter 1, if you want to get your Bibles. And who's got a Bible this morning? Let me see them. Oh, glory to God. Wouldn't it be great to have Bible sales going again? Love it. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I like the fact that the world gets to see us with, you know, Bibles going in and out of church buildings and stuff. Get to see it sitting up on the the dash of your, your car. They can say, oh, there goes another one of those nuts again. And there they can tell it's a Bible because it's got that quilted Bible cozy with the ruffles all over it. They know that somebody's granny made that for you. Those dashboards, who thought GM and Ford years ago thought they were making a dash for the car? No, no, no. Those are Bible shelves. <laughs> Bible displays. Bible displays. Use them, people. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. I've got a message. I'm excited about it. It's, it's one that will bless you. I know it will help you. It's called Excellence versus Perfection. Excellence versus perfection. I want to share Philippians uh, 1, 9 through 11 out of the uh, New English Translation. Then I want to share it out of the uh, New Living Translation because I, it has a phrase in there. And the phrase that I'm looking for you to pay attention to especially is the one where it says that you may approve what is excellent. That you may approve what is excellent. And then when I read it out of the uh, New Living Translation, the phrase is changed from so that you may approve what is excellent to something else. And, and you'll have to wait to hear that something else, so here we go. And it is, speaking of perfection and attaining to the resurrection and, and perfection, Paul writes and says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless. Now, the New Living Translation, same verse, reads like this. I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to, now here's where, in the other translations it says, or I want you to approve what is excellent, or prove what is excellent, or display excellence. I like the way the New Living says, I want you to understand what really matters. Say that with me. Understand what really matters. So that you may live pure and blameless lives. Some believers are not living that victorious pure and blameless life because they don't understand what really matters. They're confused and conflicted between excellence and the pursuit of perfection. Understanding the difference between the practice of excellence and the pursuit of perfection is understanding what really matters. Choosing excellence over perfection will make the difference in your life between fulfillment Versus a life of disappointment. For the practice of excellence is about pleasing God. But the pursuit of perfection is about pleasing people. Anyone can be excellent. But no one can be perfect. Here's what's wrong with the pursuit of perfection. When you strive to be perfect... You're being driven by standards that people have set over you. And that pursuit will destroy you because it will lead you to depend on the approval of a culture that's always changing its mind from people who can't reward you and ultimately will reject you. That's what's wrong with the pursuit of perfection. The pursuit of perfection will cause you to Overlook things you should do in order to do things that you shouldn't. For example, like choosing to help people who can't reward you because you're too busy performing for people whose rewards will leave you empty. 
while you're too busy performing for people who aren't going to reward you in the end, you're overlooking helping the people who can't do anything for you, but because it is the excellent thing to do. Now, what about Christian perfection? Because if you get your concordance out and do a little word study, the word perfection shows up a lot in the Bible, a lot in the New Testament, and there's a lot in there that says to you and I that we should strive to be perfect, that we should be perfect. So what about Christian perfection, and why is it different than perfectionism, as I'm talking about it this morning? It's because the misconception of Christian perfection is that it's about being perfect. Christian perfection is not about being perfect. But the perfection that the Bible encourages isn't being flawless, it's about being a follower. Not flawlessness, but followness. And here I go again, making up my own words, but I have a license for that, <laughs> in case anyone wonders. Yes, praise the Lord. Well, you're seeing it on display right now, actually, so. <laughs> really, Bible perfection is nothing more than the pursuit of excellence. The practice, if I, I'd like to say more than pursuit, the practice. The practice of excellence. It's practicing excellence by following Jesus. When you truly follow Jesus, you will practice excellence. In Philippians, later on in Philippians, in chapter 3, Paul uh, goes on and he's talking about perfection. He's talking about attaining the resurrection, attaining perfection. And uh, Listen to what he says and how he talks about it. He says, not as though I have already attained this. That is, I have not already been perfected, but I strive to lay hold of that for which Jesus Christ also laid hold of me. So he's saying, I'm not perfect. I'm not pursuing perfection. But what I am pursuing, I am striving to lay hold of that, T-H-A-T, that. That is one of the biggest, most powerful words used in that place in the Bible in the scriptures because the word that embodies everything that Jesus came to do. If you understand that, you will pursue that. And you won't have to be perfect. Now the word that refers to that purpose for which Jesus took hold of you. P Paul is saying, I am not perfect, but I am striving to lay hold of that purpose which was in the heart of Jesus when he laid hold of me. If I were to break this down and put it in uh, our language today, I think Paul would have said it like this. I'm not perfect. I'm not flawless. But I'm pursuing the relationship Jesus began with me. And pursuing that relationship inspires me to practice excellence. Hallelujah. That is what Christians confuse as the pursuit of perfection. If you work in your life to be the best, to be perfect, you're going to have a life of futility, ultimately of regret and misery, because you're never going to reach that mountaintop that God sent His Son to reach on our behalf. The Bible goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 13, again speaking of that same work of perfection or the pursuit of excellence, says, Now the God of peace. Now God has all kinds of characteristics. And here in this context, God chooses to identify Himself as the God of peace. Now I want you to notice that because it's, very important to understanding the difference between striving for perfection or practicing excellence. The God of peace, who brought you again from the dead through our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, makes you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So here, again, the word perfect shows up, and it talks about God making us perfect.
But let me tell you why that is, has nothing to do with what people popularly call the pursuit of perfection or trying to be perfect. That word perfect that is used there where it says that the God of peace makes you perfect is not the word flawless, but the word repair. It literally means God repaired you. He didn't make you perfect and that you make no mistakes or have no flaws, but he repaired what was broken in you. And what was broken in all people was our fellowship with the Father, our connection with our Heavenly Father. That's what was broken. Jesus repaired that. So God repairs your broken relationship with him, and then he furnishes you with the helper or the spirit of help. The Holy Spirit could rightly be called the spirit of help. He's referred to as the helper. So God repairs your relationship, then he puts or installs the helper in you so that you can now do what? Follow. You can follow. See, your perfection is in your following. So excellence replaces the world's pursuit of perfection for the child of God. And so he healed our broken relationships, sent the spirit of help into us so that he could help us to do our best. That's not being perfect. Doing your best is not being perfect. You don't have to wait till you're perfect to do your best. So doing your best because the helper's working in you as you're following Jesus, that is excellence. That's the pursuit of being excellent. Your ego, pride, your ego is what drives the pursuit of perfection. But your relationship with Jesus is what drives the practice of excellence. People that are striving to be excellent are not playing to their ego. They are worshiping Jesus by following him. And it motivates them to do their best. Because God isn't asking you to be the best. He's asking you to do your best. And if you try to be the best, as I've already said, you are playing for a society that's always changing its mind. They'll tell you you're the best today, and then tomorrow they'll be on to somebody else, and you'll be rejected. This afternoon, the Bucks take the field. The GOAT is going to lead the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to win another game. And we know this because he is the greatest of all time. The GOAT. But you know, I really don't know. I honestly don't know if Tom Brady is the GOAT because he strives to be perfect or if he does his best, if he strives for excellence. I don't know which of those motivations got him to where he is, but he's mighty good, isn't he? Just remember this. Not everybody's going to walk out onto a football field and be Tom Brady. Not everyone is going to pick up a guitar, is going to play like some virtuoso or piano or sing or whatever it is you do. In fact, you're, you grew up in a home where you never achieved perfectly pleasing your mother and father in everything that you did. There were mixed feelings <laughs> involved with your performance. But after, and maybe even before you left home, you had to decide whether you were going to live at peace with yourself. And that decision had to be made by understanding the difference between the pursuit of perfection or the practice of excellence. If you found Jesus Christ in your life, you found the God of peace. He doesn't call you to strife. He doesn't stimulate your ego. He provokes your heart with his love, and he draws you through that love, and out of it, you want to please him. And that is what causes excellence. So God is not asking you to be the best, but he is asking you to do your best. Doing your best as unto the Lord will promote you because you're pleasing God when you do it. God will promote you because you are seeking to do your best as unto him. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in chapter 12 and chapter 
13 and 14 talk about the gifts of the Spirit, and sandwiched in between the discussion about the gifts of the Spirit <coughs> is the chapter on love. We call it the agape chapter, or the love chapter. And so at the end of chapter 12, as he's about to uh, swerve into the love chapter, Paul writes, But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. So what is excellence? Again, remember, a better way of life, the best way of life, is the practice of excellence. And so Paul is saying here, desire the gifts of the Spirit that I've described to you, and, and strive for, desire and strive for the best gifts. Now, let's think about that for a moment. Among the gifts of the Spirit are the gift of prophecy, uh, working of miracles, um, the uh, gifts of healings. Are there any of those you can do without God? No. no. There's none of them that you can do without God. So, they obviously are beyond the reach of perfection. Nobody's ever going to be perfect. Only God can do those things because God is perfect, right? Yet, it says desire the best gifts. The only way you can truly desire the best gifts is to make sure there's no ego involved whatsoever. You're not doing it because you're trying to be perfect. You're doing it, why? And Paul is about to tell you the more excellent way. I will show you a more excellent way. The New Living Translation, the very same verse, reads like this. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. And, but now, let me show you a way of life that is best of all. People have oftentimes made the mistake that Paul is saying, desire the best gifts, but now nah, forget it. Just love people. That's the best way. That is foolishness. He would have never wasted a chapter talking about the gifts of the Spirit and then just say, up, oh, but you know what? If you want to piddle around and... and uh, uh, stroke your ego by healing the sick and stuff like that. Go right ahead. But we who are excellent, we will just love people. Well, of course, that's nonsense because Jesus loved people by healing them Amen. and delivering them out of the claws of Satan, breaking the tyranny of Satan's hold over their lives. How God went about doing good through Jesus Christ, healing and delivering all those who were oppressed to the devil, Acts 10, 38. Practicing excellence is inspired by God's perfect love in you. That's exactly what he's saying. The more excellent way is the desire to be excellent as unto the Lord. That love for God brings out the best in you. It motivates your desire to be excellent when nobody's watching and nobody's promised to reward you for what you're doing. You're doing it, why? As unto the Lord. Perfect love casts out all fear. We all have heard that verse out of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. When you walk in perfect love, it casts out of you, it casts out the fear of rejection. It casts out the fear of failure. People that strive for perfection live under the fear of failure. Failure, the fear of failure, the fear of being rejected by people is literally driving them, nipping at their heels as they go through life, running through life, trying to get away from that fear of rejection, trying to please people. But the Bible says perfect love, which motivates excellence, casts out fear, casts out the fear of rejection. It leaves any one of us, regardless of what your talents regardless of what your abilities are, no matter who approves of you or who doesn't approve of you, that pursuit of excellence as unto the Lord leaves you, because of the love that motivates it, motivates it within you in a state of just complete relaxation and comfort. You're not driven by the anxiety or the fear. I read a blog recently by a guy about excellence <clears throat> and he uh, brought up the two men in the Old Testament who 
God used their lives in a tremendous way to show the virtue of excellence, and that was Joseph and Daniel. And they were similar because both of them had come, had risen from a place of slavery to become the prime ministers of two different empires, one the empire of Egypt and, and the other uh, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian Empire, and then the Medo-Persian Empire. So both Daniel and Joseph had these similar experiences. And both of them were extremely excellent in all that they did. When the temptation to compromise or to draw back or to be less than God expected of them was before them, they, they passed it up. And they, even though they were in a foreign land, filled and surrounded by people who could care less whether they served God or not, they served God. Think of Joseph in that prison, or in Potiphar's house, but especially in the prison. They weren't having chapel services in there. They, these were Egyptians. They were worshiping multiple gods. He was the only one in there that knew the true living God. Yet he was upright and faithful unto the Lord even in that prison, both these men were promoted everywhere they went because of the excellent spirit that was in them. In Daniel 4, 3 and 4 says, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes of the empire because an excellent spirit was in him. So the king decided to set him over the entire realm. He, he made him to be the prime minister. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel. They were jealous concerning the kingdom, but they could find no occasion or fault within him. For so much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. And the same thing about Joseph. It's true. <clears throat> so both Joseph and Daniel were excellent in all their service, in all that they did. They served faithfully and they were consistently promoted in foreign empires. I want to stress that because we live in a world that is foreign to the kingdom of God. And you think, well, the world hates me. The world's not going to promote me. Yeah, well, if you were to pursue Jesus with excellence, the world would not be able to not promote you. These men became prime ministers of completely godless empires. That is amazing. And it didn't just happen once, it happened twice in the Old Testament. They served kings like they owned the palace. Now, both of them might have started out sweeping the floors. I know that, uh, I know that Joseph was in the prison and he was so faithful that, that the warden made him what? He made him head of the prison. He promoted him, made him head of the prison. Why? Because Joseph served in that prison like he owned the prison. Daniel swept the floors in the palace like it was his own house, like he owned the palace. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Glory to God. These guys served those kings like they owned the kingdom, and they ended up owning the kingdom. Listen, you need to start acting like you own something. You need to start acting like you own the assignment God's given you. You need to start acting like you own the job you're doing instead of doing it because you think it's somebody else's work, somebody else's home, somebody else's something or other. We go through life doing half-baked jobs because we don't own the job we're doing. We think it doesn't matter. We think our coworkers don't care, so why should I care? We think it doesn't matter what level of excellence others pursue. That's why the Bible says, do all that you do as unto the Lord. Amen. And then we complain in life because we're not getting anywhere. Why do the stories of Joseph and Daniel show up in the Bible? It's to show us that two men whose lives were over 
Daniel was a captive slave dragged off to a foreign empire as a slave. And the exact same thing with Joseph. But they wouldn't do a half-baked, lousy job. They didn't do what they did, grumbling or saying, you know what, I'm going to sabotage these Egyptians. Yeah. And I'm going, to, I'm going to do this job so that it falls apart. I'll get back at them. Or any kind of an attitude like that. But they took in hand the job that they were given to do as though they owned it unto God. Why did they do that? Because they knew that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They knew that God owns everything. I don't care if my boss, who's a godless so-and-so, has given me this task that nobody wants to do. I'm going to do it faithfully, not half-heartedly, completely. And after everyone else has gone home, I'm going to stay there to make sure the capstone's been put on it, that it's done nice. A job that I can be proud of and my Heavenly Father will be proud of. Getting really quiet. You guys were amening before. Did I swerve off into some so you need to start acting like you own some things in life and guess what God will expand your stewardship he'll promote you Hallelujah! I can just stop right now hallelujah just have the altar call right there <laughs> got one or two other things to say what if Jesus was half-baked I want to take this a step higher. What if Jesus did a half-baked job? The Bible says in Mark chapter 7, the people were completely astounded at him and said, he has done all things well. And that word well literally means beautifully, valuably, virtuously. He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Imagine if Jesus didn't practice excellence in the work that he did. Picture it. J. Iris' daughter would have been raised from the dead but left blinded by the fever. But she was made whole. Healed and made whole. Do you ever notice that? The Bible says they were healed and made whole, which means he finished the work. No half-baked jobs. Lazarus. If Jesus didn't complete his work, if he didn't operate with excellence, if he had the attitude, well, you should just be happy you're alive. <laughs> if, if Jesus wasn't excellent, he would have called the Lazarus. Lazarus would have come alive, but then he would have had to send the disciples in to drag him out because he raised him back to life crippled. Right? Come on, am I lying? When he was dead, nothing worked. If he only did half a job, He'd be alive, but his legs didn't work. Are you listening to me? Jesus didn't do any half-baked jobs. Did them totally. Completed. He completed his work. When he was at the well in Samaria, disciples came to him after he had been witnessing to the Samaritan woman all morning long, and they brought him some lunch. And they said, here, Lord, eat up. He said, oh, no. He says, I've been eating, man, and they said, well, who fed you? He said, my food, my nourishment, is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. Do you hear that? Amen. Jesus said to complete his work. Now look, if, if Jesus doesn't leave his assignments half done, should you leave your assignments half done? Excellence is commitment to be like Jesus, to do everything as unto Jesus. And he does not do half-baked jobs. Amen. So here's our altar call this morning. True excellence comes from the pure, sincere desire to please God. That's where it comes from. You know that tender-hearted, childlike desire you want to please Daddy. You just are eager. He's just come home from work. He's come through the door, and you just want to show Daddy what you made him. You want to do something for him. You want to please him. And that's where the desire to be excellent comes from. 
<clears throat> the desire to please, that desire to please, with its pure childlike innocence, is actually the atmosphere. It permeates the atmosphere of the kingdom of God. The desire to please is very powerful in the kingdom of God because it enables you to work with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit only works with people who desire to please. That is a whole other, that, that's another message we should just stop, take the offering right now because that would be worth the offering. The desire to please is the language of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit works with people who desire to please. When you see people acting like God's using them, but he's not using them, they're being motivated by the desire to be the best or to have other people think that they're the best. It's not the Holy Spirit working in them. The Holy Spirit only works with people who desire to please. The thing about the desire to please is it also makes us vulnerable to rejection from people. And so because of that, oft times, before children even grow up, the desire to please has become wounded within them. And they have withdrawn. They have withdrawn from doing their best. They've experienced rejection or being put down or being persecuted. And so they no longer try to do their best. They have withdrawn from excellence. And they end up being left fearful and indifferent. And they go through life never trying to do their best again because they don't want to be hurt. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Do you get the, get the idea? And I believe that the desire to please in each and every one of us, in many of you, it has been bruised and is a little bit wounded and needs rehabilitation, needs God's healing touch. Today, let God heal your childlike desire to please by turning that desire loose towards him. Aim it at him. Desire to please the Lord. And if you find that, that, that inert, internal desire to please is holding back, you can't seem to muster it, you can't seem to bring it forward, to eagerly want to run to the door and greet the Lord and do your best for him, then instead of thinking that you're messed up or God's rejected you or whatever, Realize what's happening. The pursuit of, the, 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 the practice of excellence in your life has been damaged, has been crippled because that desire to please has been injured. You need a healing. You need that healed in you so that those, those weights, shackles can come off of it and you can rise up and you don't care who rejects you. It doesn't matter anymore because you have aimed that desire at God who is perfect and, will, and loves you with a perfect love and will always appreciate you doing your best. And you don't have to be the best. You don't have to be perfect. Amen?